process is a is a communication tool to make sure that we're constantly aligned and, and pushing in the in the right direction. And if you just bring up the, the process and just have it in the background and just have that conversation about, you know, okay, what, what would we do differently? You, you'll straight away, you'll, you'll not only um, be able to update the process, make sure everybody's aligned there and then, but you'll undoubtedly spot other things that have changed in that time. And you say, hey, let's, let's keep that up to date. And it just brings everybody back to that um that alignment. I mean, that's what I talk about all the time. It, um, we do process work because we're trying to make sure we keep everybody aligned. We need to be constantly looking for opportunities for improvement. And we, we need to be aware of the constraints that exist that prevent us from doing what we really, really want to do. And so just looking at a process diagram, and I know it sounds kind of su super obvious and perhaps a little bit boring, but bringing that up in a team meeting can be really powerful, a simple thing like that. Welcome to the Improvement Nerds Podcast, where we host conversations about the things that nerd us out with one goal in mind, sharing best practices and sharing techniques and tools that allow us to make lasting change. In each episode, we'll feature a different idea and hopefully through that episode, give you a set of new tools, new skills, and new thinking that'll allow you to change how you do your work, how you lead others, and how you show up in your life. We're so excited that you've chosen to nerd out with us. We hope that these episodes are exactly the things that you need to hear in order to get started in making the improvements that you want to see happen in the world. If these episodes speak to you, please subscribe to our podcast, like what we're doing, and leave a comment. As, as you point out, we see then people using this as training material. They they attach you know, instructional videos and, and other documentation that help people. Um, with learning of course once you've done that it then becomes um, you know your single source of truth uh, we, we've got organizations using it for you know, onboarding new employees or onboarding people into the uh, into an existing team or even organizational design work um, we we use tagging in the system to be able to assign responsibility levels at an activity uh, on an activity in a process so you can start to say things like okay well we've got a you know we've got an accountable in this activity we've got an accountable role we've got two responsibles a consult and an, an inform uh, and then you you produce visualizations that help you see how do those responsibilities balance across the team because one of the things that happens often is that you'll have one role who he, when you look at it at a process level seems to make sense what responsibilities that they've got but when you look at it at a holistic level they have way too many responsibilities there's no way that one individual person could manage all of that work that is that has been assigned to them in, a, in the process so it helps you redesign that and and then uh, you're really focused down so that everybody is much clearer about what's expected of me in the organization wh what do i need to do and who do i interact with and who am i collaborating with margaret mead said it best when she shared that one should never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world indeed that it was the only thing that ever had i couldn't agree more let's get busy improvement nerds we've got a lot of work to do Hey, Improvement Nerds, this is Tom. I'm back with another episode of the Improvement Nerds podcast, a podcast that is all about inviting guests to come onto the show and nerd out with me about the things that they love and kind of extrapolate a little bit about how that passion has allowed them to help individuals improve, help teams improve, help organizations improve. In some cases, these ideas go outside of the four walls of an organization and into a community. So sometimes we see improvement at that scale. I have a lot of fun bringing these guests on, and today I have a great guest for you. I can't wait to introduce him. It's Craig Willis, a gentleman who I think you will all enjoy hearing from as we nerd out today. So without further ado, I welcome Craig. Pleased to be here, Tom. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. So Craig, um, give us a quick introduction and maybe a shameless plug about the organization SCORE. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so it, it's 
just to clarify, when we call the uh, the company Score, it's Score with a K, uh, and and a, and a little bit of background on on why that is. I mean, I'll explain what the product does in a second, but the the background to the name came because we we saw what we did as something like being a conductor of an orchestra, and actually we were creating the the musical scores for uh, an organization to be able to kind of everybody to work in the same way that a, an orchestra does, you know, all perfectly in time and perfectly aligned. And of course, when we went to look at the, uh, find a, a domain name, you know, web address, using the, the word score for, for musical score, well, everything was taken for, you know, for football and soccer and all of those sorts of things. So we said, hey, let's let's just change one of the letters up and see see what that does. And that, that's how we came up with the name. But to give you the uh, background of what the product does, the, 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 as, as founders of the company, we were uh, business process management, business process improvements consultants. And we worked with a lot of large enterprises, well-known brand names that, that, that you'll have heard of in pharmaceuticals, oil and gas, finance and banking, and, and so on. And what we found was that there's a, you know, a lot of very powerful process improvement techniques and software platforms available that help those organizations make sense of what's happening, uh, structure their business in a way that makes them more efficient, more effective, improving customer experience, or all of those sorts of things. But those products are often quite complex, and they have a price tag that makes them enterprise only. And we saw an opportunity that to take some of those ideas and concepts and build a product around them that just made it easier for a much wider audience to get involved in this whole area of, of process improvement. And, and that includes things like process mapping, process analysis, and, and the discipline of process management. And that's essentially how SCORE came about. It's a, you know, a lightweight platform that allows uh, businesses and analysts and consultants to to very rapidly capture and analyze processes and then share them and collaborate um, on them with a very wide audience. I think it's brilliant what you're doing. And I also think it's honorable that you've wanted to create a platform that allows organizations who need improvement to actually access it. Because you're right, the high price tag oftentimes is a high hurdle for small business to be able to clear in order to bring in an expert to facilitate change and, and improvement. And a platform like yours really opens the door for more organizations to participate. So thanks for innovating and bringing forward this platform and, and sharing your shameless plug. I think it's really cool, the idea of uh, an orchestra. I've never heard someone talk about pr an organizational uh, processes, a collection of organizational processes has um, been so much like music and it makes sense. So that's, that was really nerdy. I was going to sneeze and say nerd uh, while you were sharing. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's true. I, I, I love the, the analogy. So I, I mean, another one I uh, used uh, just yesterday, in fact, was with a, uh, an automation uh, provider uh, and in the conversation we were asked to position our relationship and I said well you know we're a little bit like we're a bit like the doctor right we, we help you sort of um, we take your symptoms and try to work out what the root cause of the problem is whereas the automation provider they're the surgeon right? <laughs> they're doing the, the deep you know the, the work to actually fix the problem yeah it's definitely a team approach to um, improve someone's health. And, you know, that was a great example of how it, it's all these different experts coming together and working around an opportunity for improvement and how each one of them has like a different expertise that can contribute to a, a life-changing transformation, whether it's in healthcare, you know, someone changing the behaviors or perspectives and living out a different life or performing a miracle to overcome, um, you know, a terrible accident, you know, seeing those teams work together 
it, I think people can really relate to those analogies. And I think your analogy definitely hit a passion of mine is the people in healthcare, they are um, uh, miracle workers in some way. So <laughs> I would <I> know <laughs> enough about your business to say you come and perform miracles, but I'm sure to the people you support who've been hitting their heads up against the wall um, with, you know, these issues that they've had when you come in and, you work with someone to map processes and start to think about automation and uh, training and empowering the workforce. And you're just giving them tools and terms like, you know, to them that could really feel like um, a major uh, catalyst and a big change can happen because of that. So maybe there isn't too much difference between what you all do and what healthcare professionals do. You're really coming in and helping an organization evaluate what's wrong, make decisions about where they want to be and take those steps to close that gap. Yeah, I, I, I think what's interesting about what you were just saying there is the is the fact that you do, like in all of these areas, you do have a very diverse range of different people in a team to make something happen, right? And you need, you need diversity in teams to be really successful because everybody has different areas of, of expertise that they, they excel at and, and you know making a great team is about getting the right people who with the skills and experience that that complement each other but one of the challenges in doing that of course and um, when you've got a room full of experts in different areas is that they all they, they will often use the same words to describe different things and that's sometimes where confusion you know and, and problems and communication arise and we've often always seen what we do is about helping teams create a common language you know, just getting a, a sort of common point of understanding so that they can start to unlock some of the complexity and the problems that, that they're dealing with in their their everyday work and it, it she said, we're not, we're not really working miracles, but sometimes unlocking that communication puzzle can feel a little bit like you've kind of made some sort of huge leap forward. We've had um, situations with some of our clients in the past where the improvements that they've made to a particular process or an area of, of their business has been almost unbelievable in in terms of how it's it's made a difference and that's just you know that's just us helping them facilitating that unlocking of the communication i i think i've seen that same kind of light bulb click within organizations too when you bring people together and just allow them to collaborate you go from all these individual ideas to this thing called collective genius and it's really pretty magical and it's cool that you've created a business that uh, seeks to do that within the partner organizations that you all work. So thanks for spotlighting SCORE. I do want to move us to the topic we're going to nerd out about, but I also want you to plug how people, before we get into the nerding, the more nerdy part of our conversation, how do people connect with you and your organization? Uh, in terms of... Uh how we generate new new business and and you know educate new people on what we're doing yeah so i see your website is get score i know that's one channel i've already gone on there and checked out a few things what are some other channels that the listeners can go to to learn more about you and your organization and kind of follow your journey yeah, well, the, probably the big one uh, outside of our website, is, as you've already highlighted, Tom, is is LinkedIn. We're we're very active on LinkedIn. It's been a fantastic platform for us to connect with like-minded individuals, and not just like-minded individuals. Actually, I, I would say that some of our better um, or, or more exciting prospects and and customers and partners we've worked with are are, are people that often have a the, the sort of um, an opposite view of doing improvement work to we we do when we first meet them, and then as we go through that um, that kind of learning and meeting for the first time, you know, we we start to sort of change their view about how how things can be done, and they often then become our our biggest fans. Uh, but in terms of other ways that we reach people, we run a a, a networking event 
it used to be in the in the old world it used to be a physical event where we used to meet up in london in, in the united kingdom here uh, but obviously this year we've moved that online and that's been really uh really exciting in terms of the growth that we started to see there and that's all about just getting people together to talk about an idea it's a little bit of a networking event and uh, we share a few ideas through some very short presentation but it's often uh, process improvement change transformation uh, consultants and practitioners really just getting together and saying hey look I'm working on this project or program over here we've got this challenge has anyone else seen anything like this come across this what's your thoughts and advice and so you, you we see some really good relationships get built out of that and of course it gives us exposure as a as a product too and and that really then leads into those practitioners using our product and using our approach in their in their projects and then often the organization that they're working in to change or transform transform looks at looks at our software as a platform for uh, building a you know an ongoing continuous improvement um, initiative around. So it it's it's interesting. We sort of start quite small, build these small communities of practitioners, but that starts to grow into you know into end user type organizations. And I think that's the conversation I've got a little bit of a sneak peek in to as I've followed you on LinkedIn is the dialogue you're driving and the network you're creating as an improvement professional myself. You know, I, I see conversations occurring in that small community you've created and the people you've surrounded yourself with. You guys are doing some really cutting edge, sophisticated improvement activities that, at least in my career, I worked in healthcare and, you know, um, it's slow to change, you know, it kind of got on the, the lean journey pretty late in the game. So in regards to advanced improvement, you know, they're, they're really just, you know, starting to get to the threshold of that. A lot of their improvement techniques uh, aside from the really big organizations like Virginia Mason or Cleveland Clinic you know they're they're really they've kicked down the door and they've run right through it and they're doing really cool stuff but otherwise in healthcare they're not really chomping at the bit yet they're still you know doing basic improvement and as I read and looked at some of your guys' conversations about using design thinking um, applying a, a business process taxonomy to classify your processes. You know, this stuff is automation. This this stuff for me as someone who worked in healthcare was great to read about, but it was more like, yeah, that's never going to happen here. And then to just see that the group of people you've surrounded yourself with and see that they are doing those things, like, okay, healthcare is really far behind. And in a lot of um the American industries, I'd say, are really far behind because I, I have a hard time benchmarking organizations using business process management here in the states, and adopting a taxonomy here in the states or doing design thinking. I mean, there's still there's pockets of them, but it's not spread globally. In some ways, I think you guys are a bit further along over there with how you're using process improvement to to drive transformation. I'm a bit jealous. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I'm not sure if um, it, it, it's an interesting angle to take. I think, I and mean, if you take the healthcare industry again, we're we're maybe uh, looking at kind of um, a sort of cultural differences across the pond. <laughs> but um, my experience of working in in the healthcare industry here is that it, it is phenomenally complex. Right. So, you know, it, it is going to be harder to move forward and it's going to be harder to change because you you've got so many more differing interests in there, try, all, all with sort of slightly different agendas trying to, to move some of these things forward. I, mean, I, I um, and again, this could be unique to this particular country, but uh, my experience in the healthcare industry was that you it's a little bit like the military in terms of structure, but but different from a, um, a private organization in that you have 
multiple hierarchies of organization uh you know you you will have the sort of the, the doctor's part organization you've got the the nursing organization and then you've got the administrative type organization and they're, they're they're almost like three separate businesses all interacting for for the same common common purpose but that uh that that adds you know, so much more complexity and that's why it then becomes so important to be able to you know, cr- create that that common language. And um, interesting, you picked up on the the term uh, the uh, taxonomy there, um, because you can, when looking for a process taxonomy within an organisation, of course you can you can find organisations uh, like the APQC, for example, that will provide um, an out of the box process classification framework that essentially gives you that, that sort of taxonomy. How do we break the organization down into the, the different component processes that we need to run it? Uh, and they they do, you know, they do a general classification framework as well as some industry specific frameworks. And so you, you can you know, literally get something off the shelf that gives you a starting point. But there are some kind of catches to doing that and and in my experience over the years that they're a great starting point they're a great benchmark right to say hey look these are all the things that an organization like us should be doing are we doing this yes no yes no but there is a danger and i've seen this happen Uh, i've seen this happen both in um in business and in in the charity sector where the organization tries to almost reverse engineer themselves into the taxonomy or into the framework rather than um, you know just using it as that benchmark and actually building their own or, or customizing it to their own organization and so in those instances you, you lose that I keep coming back to this term the, the common language uh, because that's essentially what your taxonomy is trying to do is pr- providing a way that different parts of the organization communi- can communicate with each other in a common language the problem when you start reverse engineering you you spend more time trying to do that effort and you move away from the natural way that that organization describes what it does and, and how it works and it really just ends up as some sort of you know um, men- mental exercise <laughs> That most people in the organisation don't won't recognise, and uh, and you spend an awful lot of time and get very little value out of it. I appreciate how you've kind of talked about the complexity of some of these industries and how that creates challenges, but it also kind of creates a greater need to get started and to work really hard in these areas because of the complex nature of their business. Not to use it as an excuse, but to use it as a strong business case to adopt some of these mental models and to get started on your journey. Cause I think a, another part of, you know, this, this topic we're nerding out about, we'll just kind of put it, it's kind of that stretching to adopt a, a business process classification framework. I like how you had said that. And that is re- really advanced stuff and really mature organizations are doing that. But for an organization who hasn't done anything, you can't expect them to run right to that and it just work automatically. There are logical steps that have to be taken along the way to be able to do something as sophisticated as what we're talking about today. And I think when you and I, we were doing our planning session, um, you were talking about the conflict that you've had with some of the people you have had conversation with because they want to do business process management and automation. And you're saying, no, 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 you're in the kiddie pool. There's a lot of things, there's low hanging fruit, there's opportunities that you need to be working on to kind of hone your skills before you go after this somewhat more complex and uh, challenging change to implement. And I thought that was a lot of fun because score is, I remember it's mapping process at the speed of conversation and it's everyone in the organization involved in helping to kind of collect um, what our processes are and where the opportunities exist and how do we 
use the entire organization to act on improvement and not just a small group of external or even internal consultants to execute. Yeah, it, it, exactly. The, the 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 term mapping at the speed of conversation came about actually because when I talked a little bit about our background before working with large enterprises, and you'll you'll I'm sure you'll be familiar as, as I'm sure many of your listeners will be that you know the, the sort of standard approach to mapping a, a process is. Everyone gets in a room. You stand around a whiteboard. You put your 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 sticky notes up on. You know, write your different activities. Stick them up on the board. Then someone takes a photo of those with their you know with their cell. And then you go back to your office or your desk afterwards and spend you know, hours or days typing that up. And we always felt that there was um there was a bit of a lost opportunity because you, you you're trying to you're trying to do a couple of things, and I, I there's the there's the more sophisticated change and transformation, as well as the you know just helping people make sense of the the business around them. But you know, I'm, I'm going to use the, uh, the the J word. You've got to take people on the journey in an organisation, right? You've got to help them see where the problems lie. You've got to give them the opportunity to um, articulate those problems, think about and suggest potential solutions um and and then help them implement them because you you want them to to buy into whatever change it is that's coming and we always felt there's a bit of a lost opportunity in that those workshops where you've got people stood around the board can be like really fun yeah they, they are they they're, they're often you know a lot of light bulb moments they're very interactive um, most of the time they they you know they're, they're really enjoyable you go everyone gets something out out of them but then as time starts to pass as you sort of go out the room and you, you know you're trying to write up the notes and then maybe you're sharing those through pdf documents and emails afterwards you, you start to lose that enthusiasm and, and that thread and so part of what we were trying to do was say well can we can we do all that in one workshop can we map map the processes straight into into a software product so that we can share them instantly and and share them with a wider audience straight away so we don't lose that that gap and one of the challenges in making that happen one was uh building a product a software product that is easy enough and intuitive intuitive enough to use so that you can map while someone's talking about a process but the other aspect that we found which is probably harder much harder to address in fact is finding a way to describe process that worked in that environment uh, and we actually uh, came across uh, an approach which we found we felt fit really well um, we made a few modifications in it to sort of what we felt made it a bit more intuitive but it's a very very simple framework and by being very simple it's, it's very well structured but by being very simple it actually means that everybody in the room can get involved in the creation of the process. And what we see happen um, is that people start to describe their process, but at the same time, they start to question themselves about how it works. And they start to sort of um, group information together and they start to synthesize information and they almost start to uh, perform their own analysis on their own processes. And so at the end of the workshop, what we often end, end up with is, you know, at myself as a facilitator, I actually end up just sitting there mapping into the system what they're, what, what they're describing. And they're kind of self-facilitating the session and then telling me what the opportunities for improvement and the challenges are which we're capturing. So it, it, it then becomes not just a... Um, hey, look, we can map a, we can map a process while you describe it into a system, and and that's great. You've got this much deeper understanding. That group has a much deeper understanding of their own processes, and their much deeper feeling of ownership. Um, I mean, we've also used we also often talk about change or transformation at the speed of conversation because the amount of times these sessions people say, "Well, I can fix that now." 
well, I'm going to leave this room and I'm going to go fix that thing. And I recognize that those three things are stuff that I could probably fix over the next few weeks. And then that, that there, that's a big improvement. It'd be great to do that, but okay, that's what, that's what the consultants have come in to do. So you guys take that. So we're, we're, we're improving stuff straight away without kind of waiting for some big reveal down the line. I think that is what's really got me impressed and excited and why I wanted to share your story is process mapping is one of the basic tools um, and a lot of websites you go to and um, improvement organizations, you know, one of the basic skills that they think everyone should have is the concept of flow, the concept of waste and the ability to map processes. And I think if you can give everyone in the organization the ability to think in that way and give them a tool that allows them to work somewhat self-directed, but with oversight to keep them within safe guardrails, you know, an organization can really um, lay a strong foundation, a strong foundation of what their key processes are. And I spent, I had a nine year career as an internal consultant. And at one point we were 16 black belts and project managers to an organization of 16,000. So that was one belt per thousand caregivers across a really large geographically spread health system with um, a lot of, you know, caregivers and a lot of patients. And for us to be everywhere and involved with um, the work to map every process in the organization, we were a bottleneck. And your platform really kind of allows the organization to do this activity without direct involvement of an improvement team, you know, they're still overseeing it, they're doing the education and helping get things going. But they then they go out and they start to work on the more complex change and the strategic projects that need to occur while everyone else in the organization just by mapping the processes and zooming out a little bit from what they do every day and start to think about possibly how it could be done a little bit different. You know, that leads to what you were saying is immediate improvement. There's people in these workshops who are like, I'm going to go fix that right now. Can we take a 30 minute pause? Because the juices are going and I got to act. And I think that's, you know, in an improvement, but yeah, those, when you're mapping using post-it notes and markers and conversation, that energy definitely is created, but it's not immediately acted on. And I think your, your platform really helps to shorten the time between understanding and acting. And that's really important. Yeah, I, I, there's a, a, I've got so many um, examples of what you just described there. I mean, the one that's immediately springing to mind last year was a logistics organization going through a, a human capital management systems implementation. And I'd been introduced to the uh, people director in the business. And we'd we'd had some conversations about process and process work in within the hr team um but they you know like like all businesses there are lots of different priorities and it, and they had an internal process improvement team so you know the, it was sort of felt at the time when, when that need comes up we'll, we'll get that team in and anyway, subsequently probably six weeks after that conversation that that need came up very suddenly i mean <laughs> Looking at the program, it should have been uh, pretty obvious early on. I'm sure it, it would have been to to um, some of us. But they were going through this systems implementation, and they were weeks away from a go live when the vendor came and said, "Right, we need to know this you know, specific set of requirements around a relatively small area, but some quite detailed requirements they needed in, in order to configure the system." So they said, "You, you need to." you need to share your processes with us. So the team, the HR team went to the internal improvement team and said, can you do this? And they said, yes, we can do it, but it's uh, it's going to be four weeks work for us to map all those processes and write them all up. And there's a six week lead time because we've got all these other projects going on. And uh, this HR or this people director um, called me up and said, uh, do you have any bandwidth to help us with this? Um, you know, we, we realize this is going to have a major impact on the on the, the project. 
And I said, well, what, what are we talking about? When she described the area they were mapping, I sort of flippantly said, oh, well, that will probably take us a couple of days. <laughs> and there was silence at the end of the phone for, for quite a while. And she said, if you can do that in a couple of days, could you start tomorrow? <laughs> and and we, you know, we went down, uh, we went down the, the following Friday when we were next available and we, we mapped out. 70% of those processes in a day. We had the we had the rest done and a review on on the Monday, which gave them what they needed to do. But it it's exactly what you're saying. The the it's not to say that the improvement internal improvement team wouldn't have done a you know a good job or a, you know, possibly a better job. It's that the approach they would have taken would have been a lot more detailed and wasn't necessarily what was required for this point in time. And as a result of that piece of work, of course, not only were they able to hand uh, the vendor the requirements that they needed to configure the system, but they also identified areas of the process that were lacking, into which they could then invite the process improvement team to say, "Hey, come and come, you know, come and do what you do. Like, do some proper analysis on this and tell us how we can how we can improve it." I, th- I think that is a great example of how improvement could look different within an organization through using a platform. And it doesn't have to be score um, or obviously, and for selfish reasons, you probably would like it to be, but just this concept of everyone every day engaging in what their processes are and, and thinking about them with a critical eye to identify where the most significant opportunities might exist and when it's an opportunity that's simple or low hanging fruit, you know, small tweaks or changes, you know, they can be acted on, you know, within the four walls of that department or on that small team. And then when they they uncover the big rocks, they now have enough information to really escalate that to the next level, which could be the organization's internal improvement team. And just kind of recapping my career, a lot of times you know, we would come in and we would spend a month to 45 days doing that current state analysis. Whereas if that team had already done that mapping and already done some of that analysis, we could have jumped right in into let's confirm these root causes. Let's pour, pull a little bit more data and then let's get quicker to prop that problem solving activities. So it's d- definitely through your approach or shortening the timeline to improvement and I think you're actually maximizing use of everyone's time because the individual contributors, the people who do the work day in and day out, you know, they, there's a lot that they can be doing to drive improvement with, you know, without the need of a black belt or a project manager being involved. So I think, and they probably enjoy it. They're, you know, initially they're probably thinking, oh, this is more work. But as soon as they start to make these small improvements and they see that it's uh, not not more work it is the work and it's improving how the work gets done and they are a direct beneficiary of that improvement that's going to catch like wildfire they're going to want more and more and more improvement yeah i I'm, I'm realistic though that there are not everybody in any in, in any organization gets super excited as we do about process right but there there are enough people that when they see when they see a way to do it that is within reach yeah that it's not something that they have to go and take a, a several days out to go and uh, get trained up on you know months or even years to learn and master but it's something they can do that's that's quite easy and not time consuming right and i'll give you another story about a um uh a charity that we worked with and they i mean they had a a really good internal lean team and we worked with them very closely really good team but but part of the problem and part of their frustration was that they were trying to teach each individual team within the organization to to be able to do this type of work to be able to do process mapping themselves and um we we were sort of helping to bring a system that you know our system in and show them how to use it and, and train up various teams and those sessions actually you know, out of interest were often an hour and a half two hour sessions where we'd actually sit with them and, and map one of their processes with them so they could see how how 
how it worked. You know, we give them some pointers on on which buttons to click, and then just kind of let them go and and experiment to to do it themselves. But I remember one of these sessions, the, the um, one of the participants came along to the session and said, well, I've already mapped this process. Uh, we did it six months ago internally. And she had a roll of paper under her arm. And she said, well, I said, well, that's great. Let's let, let's have a look at the process. And then we'll just look at putting it into the system. And then at least you get a feel for how you, you, you do it and how you use it. And she was brilliant. So she unrolled the piece of paper and the, at the end of the meeting room table and all the sticky notes that were in there all the, the glue had dried and <laughs> they all fell onto the the table and all she had was a piece of paper with some lines on it and uh you know it, it was then a case of do we sit there and try and make sense of, of all the sticky notes and put them in the right place and actually they sat down and went well let's let's describe the process from scratch and when they did they said it's changed even in the six months since we'd mapped this Last time, the, the process has changed because, you know, your organization and the market and your customers are all changing all the time. Um, and they were then able to adopt this as a, a much easier way to stay on top of those changes because it's now not a case of I have to go and find the rolled up piece of paper. And when I open it up, the, the stickies have all dried out and fallen off. It's, hey, look, we, we have a weekly or a monthly team meeting let, let's treat this a bit like a, a an agile retrospective. Yeah, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the re- retrospective in the in, in the agile Scrum approach. You know, at the end of each sprint, it's a let's sit down and talk talk about what worked well and what didn't. But in our next sprint, what are we going to do different? What are we going to do? Uh, what are we going to change? And if you just bring up the the process. And just have it in the background and just have that conversation about, you know, okay, what, what would we do differently? You, you'll straight away, you'll, you'll not only um, be able to update the process, make sure everybody's aligned there and then, but you'll undoubtedly spot other things that have changed in that time. And you say, hey, let's, let's keep that up to date. And it just brings everybody back to that, um, that alignment. I mean, that's what I talk about all the time. It, um, we do process work because we're trying to make sure we keep everybody aligned. We need to be constantly looking for opportunities for improvement. And we we need to be aware of the constraints that exist that prevent us from doing what we really, really want to do. And so just looking at a process diagram, and I know it sounds kind of su- super obvious and perhaps a little bit boring, but bringing that up in a team meeting can be really powerful, a simple thing like that. I love that story. and I think when we set the stage for what we were going to nerd out about, we kind of put the stake in the sand a, a, a bit further out and more on the edge of a, what a mature organization is going to want to do. But we're kind of telling the story of starting small and taking steps towards that stake that you've set out uh, ahead of you. So some of the things they've heard in our in the conversation so far is teach people how to map their process and support them to facilitate small improvement within the four walls of of their team. And so that they're going to zoom out from what they do every day and start to think about it, not as individual activities, but these interconnected activities to get work done. And then the next thing, because when we had our planning session, you said they zoom out one more time. And the obvious question they start to ask is, well, what happens before this work gets to me and what happens after this work gets to me. So they start to expand and do a little bit more systems thinking of the suppliers and their customers of each process step that they're taking. So they start to, you know, become a little bit more advanced in their thinking there and that facilitating improvement and that regards is a little bit more complex than facilitating improvement to a process that you own fully within your four walls because now you've got other people involved and, you know, that you want to be applying change management and engaging them and involving them in that change as well. So, you know, you're going from zooming out from what you do to zooming out from what you do to how it impacts what other people do. And there's a lot of opportunities that are going to come up from there. And then it says, okay, so now we're doing these projects and we're improving our processes and we've created these processes maps let's not that roll them up and put them in the corner and never visit them again but let's create possible this is a a word that a lot of people don't like let's create standard work 
where at a minimum of once a quarter, we as a team, we intentionally review our process maps and have conversations about what has changed um, and update it for currency, but also think about um, forward looking, what changes can we make in a more proactive way to anticipate what our customers might need or our regulators might need. So you got that as a third step in this now is doing uh, more in, improvement in an anticipated way instead of a reactive way. And then now that you're doing that, your processes are going to definitely improve by leaps and bounds. And now you're at the point where, okay, we're ready to standardize these things and manage these things or even spread these best practices. And that's where business process management comes into play. Yeah, I, I think the, the thing we've got to constantly remind ourselves is that you're you're not the, the job here is not to keep a process diagram up to date, right? That that that's just what happens. What processes are is a communication tool to make sure that we're constantly aligned and, and pushing in the in the right direction. Uh, and so pr process management is all about f facilitating that that process if you like it so you know, first of all do, do we understand what the current processes are do we understand the opportunities for improvement as we've all, always talked about you know, how do we measure these processes how do they fit into the wider vision and strategy for the organization and then you know constantly monitor them so that you you can make sure that that the teams are all pulling in the same direction I mean, I, it's it's rare, but we do see pockets of maturity in organizations where they they really get this working well. And we have often used the term the self-healing organization because the this this effort of process management becomes a little bit like the nervous system in the body. And that is that you the the extremities of the organization that do this well are able to sense and respond, right? Sometimes they they something will happen. They become more agile, basically, because something will happen and they um you know, are clear enough about how the organization works that they can either respond very quickly or make an informed decision that actually do I need to go back to the center to get more guidance on this. So you almost get more autonomy as well i mean i i talked about um mentioned agile before but you see this in some organizations these uh, agile teams that you know appear to work very autonomously but it, it it's again because they have a very clear understanding of their processes and often their processes what what they've done is a very very good job of simplifying the core processes that they work around um, which then takes away a lot of the guesswork. You know, this goes back to your comment just now about standardization. They standardize the way they work to a point where they don't even have to think about it and they can really focus on the, you know, the, the, the real chunky work of you know, innovating and coming up with new ideas. It gives them that autonomy. So to, to me, I think that, that's the kind of ultimate goal for process management is that, um, that agility that an organization can have. And I, just, I really don't think it's that hard. I say where we see these pockets of maturity, it's it's not a huge step up in terms of effort required to achieve that. It's more discipline and perseverance to, to make it happen. And the, and the recognition that different parts of an organization will run at different speeds. You know, some, will, some will adopt this very quickly and easily and others will just take time. I think that's really well said is that different parts of your organization they're not all going to improve at the same pace um, and it, having these pockets of excellence you know to kind of disseminate what's happening there and spotlight those things and share them with other parts of the organization to kind of plant those seeds and kind of encourage this thinking really over time allows the organization to do process management not in pockets but systematically and across the enterprise and that is like you'd already use the j word that is you know pretty far along on the journey to be doing systematic process management across the entire organization 
and you're never going to get there unless you start small and grow as you go. So I think a lot about what we talked about today is some examples. And I, I do want to circle back when you talked about standards and the autonomy that affords. There's one thing in our planning session that you shared that I thought was really brilliant was how that lays a strong foundation for you to orient individuals to their roles. Tell us, have you, do you have any examples of how organizations are using these process maps to train new hires or to promote people into new parts of their organization? Yeah, absolutely. That happens at various points along the, the process journey, is that word again. Um, I, I mean, I've had some great sessions where we've been involved in your process discovery workshops where you've got one or two new starters to the organization. And that's a real kind of eye-opening experience for someone new into an organization to then see how they to, to really get a sense of how well their new colleagues understand existing processes and how they interact with each other so that, that I, I love those sorts of situations but at the other end of that process it, it's, some, it's something we see a lot of in fact I, I mean I haven't talked too much about some of the real core use cases but one of the most common areas we see SCORE being used in is around um, systems or technology driven change and transformation right the the implementation of of new systems, whether it's ERP or CRM, I, I did mention um, you know, the HR systems before. And you you go again, you go through this cycle of first of all, you want to understand what's what's happening today. Then you can decide, you know, what what do we want to keep? What do we want to do different in the future? What is the what could the solution or the future state process look like? What are the requirements we we need for to configure the system? And then you you almost then start to look at things like okay well how are we going to test to make sure these requirements have been delivered and there's a there's an iterative step in there because you've got the solution developers saying hey you you wanted the process to work this way but actually the system doesn't quite work like that so we propose you do it this way and and we see all of this happening in score like this it becomes this center of the the conversation because. Um, you map the process up front and we have this um, you know, these, these features that allow you to pin different types of data to specific steps in the process. And so, you know, that, that could be something as simple as you know, what are the improvement opportunities when we're doing the as is process capture? You, know, you pin them against the certain steps. So you can then start to look at the process in different ways. Can I, you know, where do the, are the improvement suggestions clustering around a certain area of the process? Do they cluster around a certain role? Because that's often really interesting. Um, and then you later on use that same sort of capability to capture okay what are the requirements like how do we do document the requirements what are the must-haves um you know, should haves and, and could haves and again analyze those to make sure that we um are not doing we're not making ourselves a, a list of requirements that's going to be impossible to deliver and so you you you're constantly working with this one evolving process model in, in score and any stakeholder in this um program of work can have access to that and so that, it goes back to this converse, uh, concept of the common language right the, all these different perspectives from the end users to the program management team to the solution designers and technical teams they're all uh, using this same model to have this conversation so it makes sense that as the system then becomes ready for release that you're using the same processes to train people because you're not just training them on system functionality then you're providing the context in which they use the unit which they use the system you've got the overall uh, process context uh, and another feature of the approach we use which again i didn't mention earlier is that You've mentioned a few times about the sort of zoom in and out. You know, let, let's take a step back. Again, being kind of 
partly based on systems modeling score has this ability to say um, okay we, we understand the pr process at a certain level but I need to drill down into the detail of this area and when I've unpacked that and understood it actually one of those steps I need to drill down further and what that does is it means that you can create quite a high level conceptual view of a pro process in some cases a whole organization okay the the, the value chain and then drill down into all the different areas. And again, that helps individuals really understand when they read the process model, really understand where do they sit in that wider context? Um, you know, why are we doing these, these uh, processes? Uh, and so, you, as, as you point out, we see then people using this as training material. They, they attach you know, instructional videos and, and other documentation that help people. Um, with learning of course once you've done that it then becomes um you know your single source of truth uh, we we've got organizations using it for you know, onboarding new employees or onboarding people into the uh, into an existing team or even organizational design work um we we use tagging in the system to be able to assign responsibility levels at an activity on an activity in a process so you can start to say things like okay well we've got a you know we've got an accountable in this activity we've got an accountable role we've got two responsibles a consultant and an inform uh, and then you you produce visualizations that help you see how do those responsibilities balance across the team because one of the things that happens often is that you'll have one role who when you look at it at a process level, it seems to make sense what responsibilities that they've got. But when you look at it at a holistic level, they have way too many responsibilities. There's no way that one individual person could manage all of that work that, is, that has been assigned to them in, a, in the process. So it helps you redesign that. And, and then uh, you're really focused down so that everybody is much clearer about what's expected of me in the organization. What, what do I need to do? And who do I interact with and who am I collaborating with? I'm going to have to like pick my chin up off the desk. I think that is really um, something that I don't think I fully understood until you gave that example of the power of process, how it's not just driving improvement, but it really can be used from a management perspective of allocating your resources scaling your business it's strategic you know improvement in a lot of regards is operational it's you know there's a small opportunity here within this team to complete this activity let's fix it and it's you know yes customer centric and it's also centered on making that operators work easier but there's that operational piece of improvement that a lot of organizations um, really push all their chips in there. And a lot of my career in healthcare was doing operational improvement activities. Uh, but over time, we kind of started to think about our work a little bit different, and it did become more balanced between operations and strategy. But everything you and I had talked about in this episode up until what you just said right there was still operations. And then when you started to talk about, you know, growing your business, redesigning your business, applying resources in different ways, that's where things become more strategic. And uh, that's super nerdy stuff. Yeah, and this is the stuff that I really love. <laughs> and that's why we're here having this conversation. Uh, we, one of the uh, phrases I use commonly, in fact, we've um, just released some content around this, is we we use the term um, "your business on a page," and uh, I, I'm sure I'm sure we didn't come up with that phrase. I'm sure I, I heard it from some other consultant in the you know in the distant past. But we we now a lot of our new users on the platform we we get them very early on to start trying to think about this uh, approach. And you know, I mentioned that a lot of our users are working around systems implementations and. Um, one of one of the areas of growth we see at the moment actually is is in the area of accounting and finance systems because you know there's there's been this big push 
in the last few few years. I mean, I know this is the trend generally, but a big push in the um, with a lot of the big finance and accounting packages to move into the cloud, and a, a, a lot of businesses are jumping on the on that bandwagon. You know, a lot of accountancies, for example, are, are, are becoming more like IT companies in terms of helping their clients uh, make sense of of this of this new technology. Uh, but one of the traps that they fall into, and I, I'm picking on accountants specifically, but we see this everywhere, is that they 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 go into their customer and they say, "All right, we need to talk about your finance processes, yeah, your, you know, your month end processes, or your, or your year end processes, that sort of thing." And actually, accounting is all about how does where does the money come into the business and where does it flow out, and actually. You know, you're invoicing and you might be invoicing in your sales process and your expenses might be being generated in your project delivery process or, or whatever it is. And so early on, you need to get the client to take a much more holistic view of the organization. So this is where the business on a page comes. And we, we've we derived it essentially from what we talked about earlier, which is the uh, process classification frameworks. This is just a simple one-page view. You know, most organizations do some sort of, they, they, they develop some sort of product or service. They do some sort of marketing. They do some sort of sales. They do some sort of delivery, whether it's physical products or services or virtual. And then they probably provide some sort of aftercare. And that's the kind of core value chain and then underneath that they've got all the supporting processes yeah they're making sure you've got the right people you've got the right technology to to do what you need to do you're compliant with rules and regulations that sort of thing and it's a really simple exercise but you sit down with a business owner or an exec team at a business and just get them to think about their business in those terms and get them to assign ownership of each of those areas and get them to think about, well, how do you measure those areas? And then, okay, so we're, we're looking at the accounting system, but let's now drill into sales and, and how does that work? And that really, I mean, that, that I love those types of sessions as well, because that, that's always so eye-opening because you you immediately get this situation where people are going, oh, right, okay, well, I didn't, I never really thought about how that bit fit with the rest of the business or, you know, how did, how we actually delivered that to, to there or no wonder that's always been a problem because, you know, I've always been filling out a spreadsheet and emailing it to this inbox and actually I should have been doing something else altogether. So we try early on to get businesses to think about, you know, the processes aren't, uh, you know, the traditional tactical or operational or aren't only about the tactical or operational the very low level task centered um you know two-dimensional view actually it's much more complex than that um but you don't need to make it complex right you're building a scaffolding around which you can sort of hang everything else you need to understand and that is from a leadership perspective pretty uniting um, I think it was if you if an organization were to to try to explain what they do how ha- without having done that, it's gonna be really choppy water, especially if you interview everyone on that leadership team separately. They're gonna kind of t- tell their business story in a very different way. And that I think causes a lot of issues within an organization when it comes to prioritizing how they spend resources and how they strategize is because not that whole group doesn't understand the whole business. Every one of them understands a part of it. And because that limited site that each individual has causes a lot of conflict. So an exercise of getting your business on one page so that everyone understands how it works from a uh, process orientation can really lead to different leadership behaviors and um breakthrough you know if i if i were to revisit healthcare and i'm i just that's what i know most about is because that's where i spent a lot of my career our senior leadership team for healthcare included finance and supply chain which in, it also rev cycle nursing um you know primary care acute care and each one of those leaders, 
marketing, you can't forget about them in HR uh, operations. So that's tends to be the leadership team of any organization. Um, when it came time for them to kind of set goals and talk about their priorities, every one of them struggled to think about the entire business and they all went to where they were most familiar and just thought about their vertical, for instance. And that in some ways that behavior made the silos a little bit more thicker and the conflict a little bit higher because once you then tried to act on that strategy, you were sub-optimizing and you were causing conflict between parts of the organization that should have been working together. But because the highest level of the organization didn't know how those things worked together, the bottom of the organization when it actually came to producing, um, you know, they they were competing for the same resources or they had goals that were incompatible. And for them to actually connect the dots became harder. So I think starting at the top of the organization to summarize what your business does on one piece of paper is really sound advice. And you know, there's probably too many things in that conversation we've had for you know um, people to act on. Like their, their pockets are probably over overflowing right now with ideas. So I want to kind of try to wrap us up and ask your opinion or your advice on what do you think the listeners of this episode should do? Like, what's your call to action? from everything we've talked about? What's that one thing someone listening to this episode can do differently? Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, as you said, the conversation has been pretty comprehensive. <laughs> and there's any number of things that uh, we could pick pick from there. But I think the, the one piece of advice, and I, I'm sure to some people this might sound a little bit like uh, telling them to suck eggs, but it, it, it's about... It's got to be about simplicity, right? That it's, it's, it's got to be breaking problems down into into simple chunks to deal with. And I, you know, I talked when I was talking about the product and how we how we set out to achieve this concept of mapping at the speed of conversation. We we looked really hard and fortunately had some good experience in different approaches to thinking about process. And and the the approach that we adopted was all about simplicity. And that's what makes it easy to use. It's, it's, in my opinion, just as powerful as as any of the other approaches, much more comprehensive notations that are out there. Um, And in some ways, better engaging people because it's simple. Uh, So, you know, it's, it's, I use the term alignment a few times. You you need to get people to buy into what they're doing. You need to get people to want to come along on the journey. And if you're going to talk about process with, with non-process people, you've got to do it in a very, very simple way and communicate with them in a simple way. So that I think that's, if that's one takeaway I'll be, I'll be telling everyone, you know, if you want to go and, and then create some sort of like complex architectural model afterwards that, that only you're going to, in, or the IT team are going to look at then fine, um, but your main method of communication should be through some sort of th- simple approach. I think there's two quotes that kind of have come to mind throughout our conversation, and the first one I know who the speaker was. It was Deming who had said, "If you can't summarize it in a process, you don't know what it is that you're doing." So. Brilliant. Um, that one, and he may have used a little bit different words. He might have been slightly more crass. And then the other one was on the essence of simplicity. And I think the speaker had kind of said, any idiot can make things complex, right? But a true leader is the one who seeks simplicity. And I think your advice um, is how, how do you do these complex things in a nature that makes them approachable? and simple for people to understand and to engage in. Because if we just get more complex or more more jargon and more confusing and whatever we try to do as a result of this episode, we're, we're just going to make the gap between us as improvement-minded people and everyone else a little bit larger. And we got to find a way to kind of bridge that gap and bring these two worlds closer together to actually get things done. That's some great quotes. In fact, if there's anyone listening who is into app development, I, I think a really cool app for analysts and consultants would be a would be a, a kind of 
um, Deming quote <laughs> app that you could dip into whenever you're in a in a meeting. And I need a really good quote now. <laughs> there's, there's there's so many good uh, quotes from that area that, uh, that that are that that every time you hear them, they are always so relevant and true. You know, no, no matter how many years have passed since they were since they were said that the, the issues and challenges that organisations deal with, despite the fact that you know technology has advanced so much, that they they just remain the same, right? we're fixing the same problems over and over again i yeah i so our two calls of actions is to use the kiss principle keep it simple stupid yeah. and to google uh edwards deming's quotes and just kind of read through them and they'll bring a smile to your face because see he doesn't sugarcoat anything in the way he talks about improvement and like you'd said the things he had seen in leadership and and how organizations were administered and his era are still really relevant today. Yeah, indeed. I I have enjoyed our conversation. I cannot thank you enough for coming on and nerding out with me today and talking about the variety of topics that we dove into. I had so much fun. Likewise, I re- really enjoyed it. A fascinating conversation. Appreciate it. <laughs>